This is the NKS M1 Evo, the successor to the popular NKS M1. It's got an incredibly clean look, made of high quality CNC machined aluminum, and a ton of different configuration options. And today we're going to just take a quick look at some of the parts that I chose for this build, and then we're gonna take a look at what it's actually like to build in this new M1 Evo. Later on, we'll talk about this video sponsored NordPass, but for now, Let's get started. For the CPU, I'm gonna be using the 7800X3D. There's really not much more I can say about this chip. I've talked about it in many of my builds this year, and the bottom line here is that if you want the best CPU for gaming and it's in your budget, this is the one to get. Also plan to do a lot of heavy productivity work as well as gaming, then you could step it up to something like the 7950X3D or an i9 on the Intel side, but that will of course increase the price. For the motherboard, I'll be using the ASUS X670EI. This is an absolute overkill motherboard that, to be honest, most people really just don't need. We've got massive VRM heat sinks on here that are actively cooled. There's all sorts of dynamic overclocking options and even this separate control panel to adjust volume, plug in your headphones or other USB peripherals, and then also a few other system controls. For the rear IO, there are plenty of USB, including two USB 4 Type-C, Wi-Fi 6E, and 2.5 gig ethernet. And under this massive heatsink is room for two M.2 drives, where I'll actually be storing a single two terabyte 980 Pro drive. For the RAM, I'm just gonna be running a set of low profile sticks from Corsair. They are DDR5-6000, which is considered that right balance between cost, stability, and performance. And we've also got that expert profile to easily overclock them and then get that advertised 6,000 megahertz speed. They're short, they stay out of the way, and they should work great for this build. Okay, with the motherboard prepped, we can actually start to assemble the case. So the M1 Evo does come flat packed and it does have a pretty involved process. But with that comes a lot of versatility for component selection and layout. Now to start, if you're planning to run a Founders Edition card horizontally with a 180 degree adapter, you'll need to make sure that you have the version 1.1 kit. The easiest way I know to tell is by checking your rear panel has that extra cutout for the GPU bracket fingers. With that, you should also have some shorter motherboard standoffs to help create enough clearance for the power adapter. If you have the version 1.1 and you are planning to use that Corsair bridge, it may push up against the side panel with the cover on. In case does suggest to take off the panel to prevent that from happening. However, if you do plan to do that, it's important that you also use some electrical tape to protect the pins on the back. Okay, looking at the case, all the pieces are very neatly laid out, but I do wish that they included an organized tray for all the hardware, like many other case manufacturers have done. Some of these screws can look very similar, like the flat head screws and the short countersink screws, so I would actually recommend taking the time to organize them yourself before starting so that you don't accidentally use an incorrect screw during the build. Now, there's a few configurations to choose from here, and I'll do my best to show you how to set up each of them. Uh, the first decision that you actually need to make at this point is whether you're going to go for a standard or a flipped config. Standard meaning the motherboard is right side up and the GPU is at the bottom, flipped being, of course, the opposite with the GPU at the top. So let's grab our motherboard tray and the front and rear panels. Now, the way we're going to align this for either config is that if you notice the side of the motherboard tray that has this angled piece, this is actually the side that's going to attach to the rear panel. And the way we wanna position this is with that long cutout towards the bottom or that side of the rear panel that has the larger cutout. We can align the three holes from the motherboard tray with the holes on the rear panel, and then we can grab three of those short countersunk screws, and then we need to secure that from the backside. This first step can actually be a little bit cumbersome, but to make it much easier, let's pre-screw the top position and then with these cutouts over the holes for the rear panel, you can actually just slide the tray into position and then secure those remaining two. Now, if you're going for the standard config, you can repeat that same step for the front panel. But if you're going with the flip config, you can just flip over the tray. Then on the front panel, we'll need to remove this bracket used for the side fan bracket and then move it towards the other side. Then we can actually secure that to the motherboard tray. And in this build though, I will be going standard config. Next, let's remove the fan bracket brace with the power supply bracket brace from the top, then this piece that's going to hold our case IO from the bottom of the front panel. And then we can just put that off to the side for now. Now let's grab our power supply bracket. And what we need to do here is decide where we want the power supply to be positioned. So you can move it anywhere up and down this set of holes with the power supply unit fan facing out, or you can actually rotate it 90 degrees against that front panel. This would be a good position if you're looking to use a micro ATX board in your build. You can also use an ATX power supply if you wanted to. If it's longer than 140 millimeters, then you will be limiting the length of GPU that you can fit. Okay, so I'll be using an SFX power supply today and I'm gonna be positioning it 
at the bottom position with the power supply unit fan facing out to make room for my radiator tubes. So let's grab the power supply brace that we moved to the side and use a long countersunk screw to secure them together. And if you're gonna be going for the standard config, then let's slide the brace back into the top position and resecure it with the fan bracket brace. And then if you're going for the flipped, then you can actually put it at the bottom behind the IO piece, but I wouldn't re secure that IO piece just yet. And then use two short countersunk screws to secure it to that motherboard tray. Now let's grab our power button. And if you pick the front panel with the front IO, then we can also grab all of those IO case cables. The power button cap can just slide right into the cutout and let's take each of the IO cables and slide them into the cutouts on the IO piece. So what we want to do is slide it in that first cutout position. Otherwise, uh, they won't be flush with the front and they'll poke out, which is a mistake that I made previously and it looks really stupid. Finally, let's make sure that the yellow film is removed from the power button and then slide that into the middle position. And then we can carefully align all of our IO to the cutouts on the case. Now take your time here. It might take a second to get them all positioned incorrectly, but once they're in, we can resecure the IO holder with those original screws. Now let's make sure that the power button and the PCB is nicely aligned and then we can use two short uh, flathead screws to secure it. And you just wanna tighten them to pressure fit against the power button cover. And the last few things we need to do before we get to installing our components is to secure the power extension on the rear panel with two long countersunk screws. Then I like to install the feet on the bottom panel so that I don't have to worry about it later. I put mine in a slightly different spot from the official directions just because where they're supposed to go, it actually blocks the bottom panel installation holes and I like easier access to those. Now on the motherboard side, there are some pre-installed standoffs and all of the holes on these two pieces allow us to move the motherboard position up and down depending on what configuration you're going for. So if you're going for a standard layout and you want to fit a massive four slot GPU, then you'd want the motherboard in the top position. But because I'm gonna be using a radiator, we'll need to give more room at the top. And so I'll actually be lowering the motherboard to the bottom position to give that space. This bottom position is really only going to work though if you're gonna be installing a vertical GPU mount as well. So depending on the components and config that you plan to use, then you could position this higher if you need to, of course. Then we can secure it with the four short flathead screws. All right, now let's take a look at this video sponsor, NordPass. So if you're looking to enhance your company security, NordPass is an intuitive and easy to use password manager, perfect for decluttering your work and personal online life. NordPass can help if you struggle with juggling multiple passwords and keeping your digital workspace clutter-free. You can save logins for all of your accounts in one secure place, and each password can be automatically created for you with the password generator. This way you get strong, unique credentials in an instant. If you need something even more secure than passwords, then you can check out their pass keys. They're an easy way to log into all of your accounts, whether you're at home or in the office, and you don't even need to remember anything about your pass keys other than where you stored them, as you can use biometric authentication or device pin to access them. From emails to your project management tools, everything is organized and easily accessible. It's a completely seamless and secure way to collaborate with your team. NordPass also ensures that your team can work across different devices and apps without any interruptions. Log in, share, and make payments efficiently, all backed by the highest standard of cyber secure technology. So if you're ready to take control of your digital health, check out the link in the description below for a free three month trial. Next, we can grab our power supply unit and let's plug in all of our needed cables into the unit before bringing it over to the case. Then we can just align it to the bracket that we installed earlier and secure it with the screws that are included with the power supply. Now, this is probably a good point to start plugging in your case cables and power connections, then do a bit of cable management to get ready for the next steps. So now there are a few different directions that you can go in this step. First, if you're going air-cooled, then you can install your cooler now if you didn't already do that when you were prepping your motherboard. The case can support an air cooler up to 135 millimeters in height. In my previous build, I put in one that was 110 millimeters, which gave plenty of extra room above it for a slim 120 millimeter fan. And I actually got pretty good results there. For today, I'll be using that top mounted radiator and I'm gonna be using the Fractal Lumen S24 V2 RGB. I picked this one up mostly for its low profile CPU block. And it's nice that you have the pump built into the rad so that you don't really need to worry about its position relative to the block. Now let's line up the fans on the radiator and secure them, then grab our fan brackets and align those up on the other side. And I'm gonna try to put this as close to center here as possible. And then we can secure the two fan brackets to that radiator. Now we can lower the radiator with the fan brackets down into the case and we should get a nice fit here. So that we can finally lock it in. Now, because I have an AM5 socket, I will of course be using the AM5 bracket for the pump, but if you're running Intel, they do include a backplate and bracket for that as well. The block has thermal paste pre-applied, so I'm actually just going to run with that and lower it down onto the CPU and secure it. 
Now let's plug in our fan cables and USB for the pump. There's actually another RGB cable that you can plug in for the pump lock if you wanted to. Because I'm going to be running a vertical GPU, you're not probably gonna be able to see it much anyway, so I think I'll just kind of skip that step. Now, if you're running a different config from mine, you could obviously install a couple of fans at the top instead. And if you are running flipped config, you can use a couple of standoffs to attach that second fan bracket brace to the rear panel to run top fans if you wanted to as well. There's also the option of installing the fan brackets on the side for some side mounted fans or a radiator up to 280 millimeters. And you really only just need one of those brackets for the side fans. I just used two because I kind of thought it looked cool. Okay, now we can finally install our GPU. And so I'm gonna be running the AMD 7900 XT. You can currently pick these up for around $770, which is a big decrease from their initial MSRP and actually makes this pretty competitively priced. It's basically the same price as a 4070 Ti, but you get 20 gigs of RAM instead of the 12 offer than the 4070 Ti, which is especially useful if you're planning to play at higher resolutions. With that said, if you can wait until next month, it's rumored that we'll be seeing some new super series cards from Nvidia that may actually disrupt this price point. Now this particular card is dual slot and 290 millimeters in length. So we'll have no problems fitting it in here as you can fit up to a four slot GPU, 359 millimeters in length and up to 140 millimeters in height horizontally or 165 vertically. So you should be able to fit most partner cards and even some really massive 4090s. For your standard horizontal GPU install, we need to grab our GPU mounting bracket and have it ready. Then we just need to remove this plate on the rear panel and then slide it into the slot. Then we can replace the plate we removed and actually install the GPU mounting bracket. And then you just secure the GPU to that bracket as well with a couple of flathead screws. Now, because I'll be going with a vertical mount in this setup, I'm first gonna secure the PCI Express 4 cable to the PCI Express 4 bracket with two flathead screws. And then from there, we can secure it to the mounting points along the bottom panel. So once we have that installed, let's put the PCI Express 4 riser cable into the motherboard and then secure the bottom panel to the case. Now, in order to actually fit the GPU in at this point, we'll need to take off the two plates from the back panel to give the GPU enough room whenever we're you know, trying to maneuver into the case. Okay, so now we can actually grab the GPU, lower it into the case, and then align it to that PCI Express slot, push it down until it locks. Now on the back, we just need to install this piece that will actually allow us to secure the GPU to the case. And it's actually going to occupy the same bottom two holes as the plate we needed to remove a few moments earlier. And then from there, we can just secure that GPU to the GPU bracket. And if you wanna install a couple of these PCI Express covers while you're here, you can do that also. All we have left to do is plug in our power connectors into the GPU, slide on our side panels and secure the top panel. And that's the build complete. A lot of steps here, but you do have to admit, the end result is pretty epic. Okay, so taking a look at cooling, with the ventilated panel on, the CPU cooling is better with the AIO by around four to six degrees Celsius, compared to the air cooling setup that I did in the last video. There, I was using the Noctua NHD9L. Both of them are using a standard fan profile, but that air-cooled version with the extra fans are still holding their own. And keep in mind that I am using a different GPU in each of these setups, so the frame rates and the GPU temps are going to be different. As for the GPU temps with the vented panel, we're sitting around 70 degrees Celsius, and you can expect a pretty big hit in GPU temps if you do decide to go with the glass panel. So I would recommend trying to set your GPU as far back from the glass panel as possible if you're wanting to go that route. And if you were planning to put a bigger card in here that's gonna kind of push up against the panel, I would probably steer clear of the glass. Noise levels aren't too bad either, sitting at around 43 decibels, one and a half feet away from the PC. Although I have found that the pitch of the fan noise is more noticeable on these fractal fans than others that I've used. So I would probably swap these out with some Arctic or Noctua fans. So yeah, that's the M1. The more I work with this case and discover all of the different possibilities, the more I do really like it. I think the only thing stopping this from being the like perfect 15 liter case is the width. Now, I do love the slim look that they're going for. It's very similar to the T1 in that regard, and it does look really good. But if it was just a few millimeters wider to give enough room to comfortably fit that GPU bridge with the cover on, or better yet, a custom cable, that would definitely improve things. And like I said in my other video, it could give enough room for slightly larger CPU coolers like the uh, D12L. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about it in the comments below. If you want to see a very similar case that is even smaller, check out my video on the Forms T1. Or you can take a look at some of my favorite ITX cases of this year by clicking the thumbnails on the screen. So anyways, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.